Welcome back students. So we have looked at motion of the dislocations. The next thing that we will be discussing is the resistance that comes to this motion. So we remember when we talked about the theoretical strength, so the, all of the atoms have to break. And then because of that, we see that sinusoidal energy values. Now, although the whole plane is not getting sheared, and even if the row is getting sheared and even if uh, only steps, it is moving in steps, but still there are resistance in that sinusoidal way. And this uh, resistance arises primarily from two sources. One is the size of the core and other is uh, the density of the plates, meaning lattice resistance. So, depending on what is the resistance of uh, what is the density of the planes different planes have different resistance and that is why we have certain preferred planes for glide of the dislocations and which leads us to what we say as the slip system so certain planes would be preferred and but we already know that for certain directions are what become the burgers vector so the together the direction and the plane define the dislocation and hence we together we call what is called as now the slip system. So for different crystal system, you would see that we have, have different slip systems. So with this introduction, let's move on to understand what kind of resistance does dislocation face in motion. So like I said, there are two fold resistance to dislocation motion and One is from the core, that is from the dislocation structure itself, and the other is coming from lattice. And as uh, we would look into it, we will understand that these two are actually interrelated. So on the face of it, we can say they are two different factors, but they are one and the same thing. So let's look at what do we mean by resistance to dislocation motion from the core. So what it means is that the size of the core defines or the total amount of resistance that would be faced by the dislocation would be dependent upon the size of the core. So for that, first, let's try to understand what is what do we mean by size of the core. So I will draw uh, edge dislocation with two different core sizes. Okay, so once we understand the size of the core, we will move on to understand how it affects the dislocation motion. So, over here, the, uh, let's say this is the extra half plane. And so it goes only up to this point. So this is our dislocation. And what we see is that it should be symmetric. It is just that when I'm drawing by hand, it is not so accurate, but it should be symmetric. Okay, so this is one uh, extreme where I'm trying to show that the core is larger in size. And I will show the other extreme where thus I will try to show that the core is very small. So this is the plane of the atom. This is the plane of the atom. And 
and here is our edge dislocation. So what do we see? What we see is that in this one, these atoms are also displaced from its position and they have moved away from their equilibrium position. And therefore, we can say that the displacements are large even uh, for this atom and even for this atom. On the other hand, when we look at this example, here we see that these two atoms are almost not displaced. There may be a very minor change in their position. While there is a good amount of displacement for this particular, uh, these two atoms, the one just next to the extra half plane. And again, these two are almost not moved. Now, if we were to look at displacement with respect to B, so let's say we draw with respect to the central line, delta U by B. So on the y-axis, what we have, the quantity is delta U displacement, but of course it has to be with respect to B. And similarly, I draw it over here. And the x-axis is the usual distance. So what we know is that here, the displacements are large up to a very good extent. So the curve would look something like this. So the displacement is, signs are different on the left and right hand side, which is represented like this. On the other hand, the atom, the displacement goes almost to zero, which would be represented something like this. There may be small amount of displacement. And if we define that the region up to which delta U by B is 0.1, or basically the point up to which the displacement is 10% of the Berger's vector, is defined as the core. So we will draw a line here like this. So let's say this is plus minus 10%. And here also we draw the plus minus 10%. plus minus 10% or 0.1 strain. So if we say that the core is up to the 10%, then what it means that the core for this particular dislocation is all the way up to here. So this would be the size of the core. For the left, left side example, while here we see that it is only, so here we are drawing up to this point, this is where it intersects. And here we see that the 10% line intersects somewhere here. It's not uh, drawn very accurately, but somewhere around this, even from this uh, schematic, it is clear that size of the core is very different. So here, size of core is large. And here, size of core is small. Now, this size of the core has a very strong effect on how the dislocation moves. When the size of the core is very large, then it is easier for it to move. When the size of the core is small, it faces much larger resistance. So we'll give some rough estimate on how large or how much difference can it become. And it, you would be surprised at the amount of uh, difference the size of core can make. But first, let me just summarize what I have just uh, mentioned. When distortion, I'm writing distortion, which are dislocation core,
is large, the dislocation is easy to move. So clearly this one has a large dislocation core, so it is easier to move. On the other hand, this will be, this like just I mentioned, the uh, size of the core is small, so this dislocation would be difficult to move. So at first it may look a little counterintuitive, but yes, that is the case. Larger the core, easier to move. Smaller the core, more difficult to move. And when we are defining the size uh, dislocation core, we have to remember that the width of dislocation core is defined as the distance over which displacements of the atoms are large enough that uh, what do we mean by large enough that we will not be able to apply linear theory of elasticity. So that is what has been defined as the cutoff for dislocation core. So you remember even when we, we obtained the stress field and strain field, we applied linear theory of elasticity. And therefore, this uh, theory was not applicable for dislocation core. Now we, can, we would say, uh, in the same vein, we will define that the core is where that where the, the displacement is so large that theory of linear elasticity cannot be applied. And it is generally accepted to be of the order of B by 10. So in magnitude wise, when 10% of the Berger's vector value, the displacement is close to, uh, is more than 10% of the Berger's vector, then we would say that we will not be applying the theory of linear elasticity. And this width is usually denoted by And just to give you, like I said, a rough estimate of how much difference it can make. So let's say if your tau is the shear stress required to move the dislocation, then it would vary like this. So let's say this is the W, this is the tau. And if the width is zero, meaning basically there is no dislocation, then shear stress that would be required would be of the order of G. And just when the width increases to B, then the shear stress reduces drastically to G by 400. So just by additional one layer of atom thickness of the dislocation core from zero layer, we can see that the shear stress requirement has dropped by two orders of magnitude. And if we were to make the width 5B, it will come down to several orders. These are some simulation experiments carried out by Prasan and Subramaniam, and it is based on these. So the actual values may differ from material to material. So we can say dislocation glide occurs 
most easily in wide dislocations. These wide dislocations are found in metals with simple closed pack structure. And hence, these materials are ductile. On the other hand, ceramics tend to have narrow dislocation. And not surprisingly, the dislocations there are difficult to move. And hence are have high strength but brittle. Another factor which is where which is gets related to the next uh, resistance, next factor for resistance, which is lattice the resistance is the fact that large interplanar distance of the planes leads to wider core. So if the lattice uh, planes are such that it has in larger interplanar distance, then it leads to wider core. And hence the dislocation becomes more easier to move. And hence the material will be more ductile in nature. So which brings us to our next factor, which is resistance to In this location motion lattice so the lattice resistance to the dislocation motion so we know that the dislocations then they are trying to move so basically there will be so there will be lattice resistance so there will be valley like this and which is called pearls nevaro valley so let's say this is the extra half plane. So you need to move the extra half plane. This is how it would have the energy variation where we can say that this is the E P N, what is called as Pearl Navarro energy from where we can calculate the Pearl Navarro stress. So when stress is applied, dislocations move and face additional sinusoidal resistance of lattice. Sinusoidal resistance, which is depicted here. due to lattice.
so if you were to write down the pearl nebaro energy which is actually varying but if we look only at the amplitude then the amplitude can be given by this equation and if we have the energy we know that we can calculate the shear stress which will be by differentiating this relation with respect to b so tau pn which will be equal to so when we differentiate where this minus 2 pi will come out and there will be b square which will again be minus 1 over b square so this minus gets cancelled into epn and therefore this tau pn the shear stress so now we are in looking at terms of the shear stress that needs to be applied to move the dislocation so we have already mentioned that you need to apply a shear stress to get the dislocations moving and that has to be applied parallel to the burgers vector so tau pn that we will get will be equal to 2g by 1 minus nu exp now this is a very important equation from where we will be able to derive what should be the slip system of the material here w width is uh, you can give it in terms of the lattice parameter and the poisson ratio so a is the lattice parameter and nu is the poisson ratio therefore you can replace this by 2 pi a by 1 minus nu and now if you want to have a slip system or you want to define a slip system then we know that we want a dislocation or the dislocations would want to move on a plane where least resistance is present which means the tau pn is the smallest so now all we need to find out is what are the condition that leads to the smallest value of tau pn so we can list it so one of the parameters that we can uh, for given material that can be selected is a and the other is b not sorry not the a but uh, the particular plane so i made a mistake here this a is not the lattice parameter let me define it a is the interplanar spacing and w is the width of the core so clearly what we had mentioned earlier that uh, large interplanar uh, distance leads to wider core which is what we see here so large interplanar core means larger width and hence easier movement of the dislocation and uh, a is the interplanar spacing so again let me Uh, re-emphasize a is not the lattice parameter but the interplanar spacing. Okay, so a is something for a given material we can decide basically whether it should be one 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 zero zero one one zero or any other plane. And similarly, b which particular direction should be b one zero zero one one zero one 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 and so on. So a and b are something that we can select and accordingly we can see which one would give the smallest value of tau pn. Other factors like nu. is a material property g is a material property so we cannot change that and therefore those remain constant so now let's look at what values of a and b would lead to the smallest value of tau pn so a the inter planar spacing over here now if we look for tau pn to be small this whole quantity should be small which means this is there is a negative sign so therefore this quantity should be larger and this quantity should be smaller so what it is saying is that a should be as large as possible should be large so what we want is that the glide planes with wider interplanar spacing
which at the same time, when it has a wider interplane spacing, it means that on that particular plane, the density of atoms is very large. So densest planes. So in other words, we can either look at planes with highest interplane spacing, or we can look at planes which have densest atomic density, uh, densest planes. So this defines the A for a given system. Now coming to B, we have said it should be small because it is a whole quantity has to be small as far as possible. And therefore, this would be small if B is small. This will make it large, which means minus term would be large. And therefore, the whole quantity would be small. And therefore, B should be small. And when we say B should be small, it means slip. You remember B, Berger's vector is also called the slip vector. So slip vector or slip should be along direction with shortest lattice transition. Or in other words, slip should be along closest pack direction. So once we have a given material system, and there are only certain type of material systems. And in when we limit it to metals, where we see the deformation, we are mostly talking about FCC, BCC, and in some cases, simple qubit. So let's look at with the example of BCC and FCC. What we have understood is that A should be densest and B should also be densest. So A or basically we should select the densest planes and the densest direction. The densest planes would become the planes where the glide will take place and B is the slip vector which should be along the densest direction. So let's uh, look at BCC. And there are primarily three main planes which we will consider. So that I can also draw the planes. How would the planes look like in BCC? We know that if you draw the, join the corners of the cube, then you have atoms at the corner. So the atoms would look like somewhere over here, over here and over here. And uh, then the next column I want to have over here is the number of atoms. Because if you want to find the density of atoms, what we need is number of atoms and the area of the region of under consideration. This will give us when we divide number of atoms and by A, then we will get planar density, which will be equal to N over A. And then we can also look at A, value of A. So over here for the 111 plane, clearly what you have is 161616, one, one, three of these, which brings us to 1 over 2, total number of atoms as 1 over 2. And the area is a equilateral triangle. So this will be root 3 by 4. And the length here is a not root 2 whole square. So when you put it over here, what you would see that it comes out to 1 over root 3 a not square. And I will come to the interplanar spacing uh, in a little later stage. First, let me compare the other planes. So the other important planes for the uh, cubic system are 1110. So in a BCC, you have atoms only at the center. So 110 also has one atom at the center and four atoms at the corner, which are quarter of the atoms. So overall, it makes up two atoms. So the number of atoms is two. And the area here is A naught root two times A naught. 
therefore, and here I'm using the term A naught, which is lattice parameter. So this is not interplanar spacing. Interplanar spacing is given by A. So this becomes A naught square root two, and therefore your planar density would come out to root two by A naught square. Now moving on to the third plane, which is one zero zero, which is simplest of all these three. It is A naught by A naught area, and there are four atoms at the corners. So what we get here is number of atoms, one by four into four equal to one, area is A naught square, and the planar density will turn out to be one over A naught square. So clearly what we see that the planar density is highest for this particular case. Which is the 110. And not surprisingly, for BCC, 110 is the preferred slip or glide plane. And uh, the last thing that I was about to write here is the distance between the planes. And uh, you can find out that for one, the 111 planes, the distance between them is A0 by 2 root 3. For 110, it will come out to A0 by root 2. And for the 100, it will come out to A0 by 2. So again, what we see is that this is the largest value. And these are much smaller than this. So this has the largest interplanar spacing in the case of BCC atoms. And therefore, this is the glide plane. So we have looked at the glide plane. And when it comes to the tensor direction, then it is again not very difficult to imagine. So BCC, we have an atom at the center. Then we have atoms at the corner. And the atoms are actually touching the, only along the body diagonal, which is along this one. Which is along one 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 direction, and the basic lattice vector, uh, sorry, the basic translation vector from one atom to the other atom would be half of this, and therefore this will come out to Burgess vector equal to e by two one one one, and the glide plane we saw was of the family one one zero. So together, these this forms the slip system for the BCC material. Now let's move on to the FCC material. So again, here the three primary planes, which are contenders, you can imagine, would be the ones with low values of the numbers. And uh, those will be 100, 110, and 111. So again, I will start with 111. And here it is FCC. Again, I will have to write uh, the number of atoms, area, and planar density. So number of atoms and area of the region being considered, planar density, which will be equal to N by A. And then lastly, what we have is A, the interplanar spatial. So for 111, we have atoms over here, one sixth, one sixth atoms over here. We also have one half atoms over here. So overall, the number of atoms for this one will turn out to be two. And the area of the 
region considered is same as the equilateral triangle that we said earlier for the BCC. So it is root three by four, A naught root two whole square. And when you calculate the planar density, it comes out to four by root three A naught square. And then let's move on to 110. So this will be rectangle in shape. And we have atoms at the corners and also on two of the edge centers, which are half. And the total number of atoms again comes out to two. Area is A naught square root two, A naught root two times A naught. And therefore the planar density comes out to root two by A naught square. Now moving on to the last plane, which is one zero zero. So here it is square shaped A naught by A naught. And the atoms are located and the corners and one also in the face center. The total number of atoms here is two, area is A naught square, therefore two by A naught square. Now clearly the planar density is So clearly the planar density is highest for this one. This is four by 1.732. So it is greater than two and this is two. So, and this is 1.732. So we are comparing other factors are constant two, 1.732 and some uh, number greater than two. So this one is clearly highest. Therefore, this is the glide plane, preferred glide plane for FCC system. And again, if you look at the value of uh, the, the interplanar spacing, you would find that this is A naught by root three. For this one, it will come out to A naught by two. And this one will come out to A naught by two root two. So I will leave it, I leave it to you to find out how we obtain this number. It is not very difficult. You have to just imagine the cube where the planes, uh, the for example, 111 planes, which are carrying these atoms and count the number of planes along the along a given known length. So for example, 111, you would count the number along the main body diagonal. And therefore you would be able to find the number of in the distance between the planes. And this also clearly is highest value for the 111. So that is uh, the glide plane. And for the Verger's vector B value, we said it should be the shortest translation vector. So again, it's not very difficult. What we have to look at is the unit cell. And in this particular case, you would be well aware that the atoms touch along face diagonal, which is one, one, zero. Hence closest or hence uh, closest back direction. So this total length is 110 and this much is the translation from one atom to another. Therefore, the Burgess vector would be A by two, 110 and the glide plane would be 111. So now uh, we have looked at the slip system for 
the FCC and the BCC system. We will not uh, derive for the HCP. It's you can do that as as a exercise as an assignment. I will just summarize what are the slip systems for the various uh, cubic materials. So, not materials, but various crystal systems. Crystal system, slip planes, and the slip direction. So, we are looking at BCC, FCC, and HCP. For BCC, we know it is 110, which is the slip plane, which was the preferred one. And the direction came out to be 111. For FCC, 111 is the closest packed plane uh, or densest plane. And 110 is the closest packed direction. And to be precise, if I want to, I should actually write not. Uh, the slip direction, I should mention Berger's vector or slip vector. And therefore, this would be A by 2, A by 2. For HCP, the slip plane, which is the closest to clo uh, the densest plane, you can easily show it is the basal plane. And for the slip vector, it is A by 6, 1, 1, bar 2, 0. For HCP, we use the HKIL format to define the directions and planes. So there are four numbers instead of the three numbers. So overall, we have looked at the uh, slip system. We were able to derive the slip system based on our understanding of the resistance to dislocation motion that is experienced, which is coming out from the lattice, uh, the pearls Navarro Valley uh, that is present when a dislocation moves. And we know the energy. If you know the energy variation, so we can take the amplitude portion and we can differentiate to calculate the shear stress the required minimum shear stress required for the dislocations to move and then we can compare and based on that equation we derived that a should be the densest plane and b should be the densest direction and where a defines the glide plane and b is the burgess vector for bcc we saw that it is clearly 110 is the closest uh, or the densest plane and one a by two one 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 is the translation vector Berger's vector for FCC one 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 is the densest plane and a by two one one zero is the Berger's vector. We didn't derive for XCP. We are mentioning that zero 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 one is the densest plane and a by six one 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 bar two zero is the slip vector. So we with that we complete the slip system for the uh, various materials, we are now in a position to understand which particular planes and uh, which particular planes the, the dislocations would like to glide. So we will look at some examples in the next few lectures to be able to appreciate it better. Thank you.